So this is a topic that we've all been thinking about for a super long time. And I'm just gonna share a brief introduction of each of these two incredible experts. So Dr. Dune Ives is executive director of Lonely Whale, where she designs and leads initiatives that address environmental degradation and species decline with a focus on single-use plastics. Her expertise is in sustainability and environmental business issues for corporate, municipal, nonprofit, and philanthropic institutions. And I can actually vouch for all, all of those things being, <laughs> being true. Um, and we have Professor Doctor um, Jenna Jambeck. Well, you, you got three doctors on the stage tonight. I mean, come on, right? Dr. Jambeck is a National Geographic Fellow and an Associate Professor at University of Georgia College of Engineering. She's been conducting research on solid waste issues for over 20 years with related projects on marine debris since 2001. She's like the OG of plastic research. Um, specializing in global waste management issues and plastic contamination. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, so I have a lot of questions for you, but I want to start with like the very basic question. Like how did we get into this crazy mess where we're so dependent on plastic for everything? What happened? Where did we go astray? You want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever feels so moved. Yeah. Well, I think um, going back to the use of plastic probably in World War II, um, and that after that, trying to bring it to the mainstream, in many ways I think we've been doing the opposite of what we talk about in green engineering. Um, we have a lot of a material and we're trying to find uses for it instead of having a need for something and then saying, oh, this would be a good need. So, um, so we have a lot of this material and it is very useful. You can color it, texturize it, it can be hard, rigid, it can be soft, it can be flexible. So many of those reasons as well which have made it so useful and just exponentially increase in use, um, that coupled with economic growth. Um, so many, I mean, this, this issue is a complex system, no doubt. So it's intertwined with so many um, global development issues and um, society, culture, lots of things, but um, ultimately sort of driven, I think, a lot by consumerism as well. So all those things, complexity, and then the fact that it's very hard then at its end of life to manage. So the ultimate, endpoint for it was never really thought about before and that's exactly what I work in in terms of waste management it's like whatever comes our way we have to deal with and um, it's not easy and this has been one of the most challenging materials no doubt that we'll talk about in a lot more detail yeah. so do more from like the socio-cultural perspective how do we get into this mess so I think it, it's really important to understand that we got into this mess just a short time ago. It's not like this has been building for 100 years. This has really been building for the last couple of decades. And in a way, it's happened to us almost without us knowing it. Right? So I think that there is a lot of conversation about consumers and consumer demand. I, for one, I'm 48 years old. I was born in 1971. Right? I did not wake up one day and say, I wish that my English cucumber was wrapped in plastic because that would be amazing. I also didn't wake up one day to say, gosh, I wish that I could feed my child in the middle of the night out of these amazingly diverse options that are put into this packaging that actually can't be reused right now. There is no end of life for this. And so I do think it's a combination of the plastics industry was brilliant. It found a use for something that none of us even knew existed. And it has turned that material into this, this, this packaging that has uh, no shelf life on it. It will never expire. And, and it does do a lot of good for a lot of people around the world. Um, and so for us as consumers, we woke up one day and we're like, huh, it's fascinating. That's There's, convenient. It's, it's convenient. I'll and, take one of those. And I'll take my coffee to go, please, in that paper cup which is lined with plastic that has a plastic lid. And oh, by the way, my child, who's five, is extremely thirsty. And I once again forgot reusable water bottle number 50 that I have in my kitchen cabinet. And the, you know who you are out here in the audience. You have it as well. So I'm going to buy a single-use plastic water bottle because my child is thirsty. So I think it's been this, this great kind of marriage of 
convenience, need, opportunity. But again, it's only happened within the last couple of decades that now we see so much single-use plastic, especially packaging, in our everyday life. So my mother fancies herself to be my research assistant, which is fun. Um, and she, she had the, the point that you made about this being a new problem. She wanted me to help me contextualize that. So she sent me a lovely email last night with her thoughts, with the subject line, remembering pre-plastic living early 1950s. This is the subject of the following email. Just to add a little color to what you were describing. Um, she, she grew up in an early suburb on Long Island with a main street lined with a series of shops, butcher, deli, baker, shoe repair, hardware, luncheonette, soda parlor, jewelry store, five and dime, supermarket, sewing store, etc. All stores used only brown paper bags. Some breakable items were wrapped in tissue paper. Meats were never prepackaged, all cut selected by the customer and wrapped in butcher paper and tied with twine um, and went straight into the freezer if needed. Vegetables were loaded in paper bags at checkout. Soaps were all powdered in boxes, except bar soaps were wrapped in paper. Milk and soda and juices and wet foods were in glass jars with metal caps and bread was in white paper bags. Um, and it sort of goes on from there. She, she can't remember chips or dried pet food <laughs> or shampoos or toothpaste. The toiletries were just so many fewer in number. Hardware stores, the tools, the screws were not prepackaged. They were sold by weight and you put them in a paper bag or by number. And, you know, kids brought lunch boxes and not Lunchables um, and that everything was simpler. So her takeaway and question is... Um, is the only feasible way to cut back on plastic and waste in general, does that need to include some amount of relocalizing where we're not all like ordering Amazon same day delivery all the time, but actually like walking around the corner um, and thinking smaller scale again? Um, and she has then like a fire line at the end no Amazon, no Walmart, no mega corporations, no unregulated monopolies. <laughs> so. <laughs> In case you like wonder where I get it from, like these are the emails that I wake up to. Um, and I appreciate them because it's so easy to think that this is like a thing that we've been dealing with forever, but this like, this is like a 50 year old problem. Um, and so I'd love to hear from you, like do you think that this is a situation where because it's a younger problem, the solutions are maybe easier? Is this like relocalization? viable to some degree? Obviously, we have a really entrenched new system. I, I think I'm a firm believer that the way things were are not the way things are going to be. I don't think that's possible. And I might be a naysayer in this space. And, and I say this with great conviction because my husband and I left corporate America at one point, bought a five acre farm, turned it into an organic farm, had 40 chickens at one point, which is a lot of chickens to yeah. have <laughs> on one farm. That's a lot of eggs to eat. I'm yeah. now allergic to eggs. Oh my God. <laughs> no surprise how that happened. Um, but we went back to the way that we thought life was going to be for us and we learned a tremendous amount about that. We learned a lot about ourselves. We learned a lot about society. We learned a lot about what it means to be part of community. And, and I think for me, that's a word that I hold as we think about how do, where do we get to next? So I wouldn't want to design with what we've had. And I think you have a lot to say about that as well. I think this is a really amazing opportunity to think through where can we go? What, where are the options? How do we get to where we need to go much more quickly and not hold on to anyone's stereotype or ideal about the way we think it should be? Because it's completely different now than it was in early 1950s. I wasn't alive then. Mm -hmm. Um, but I love the idea of like a soda fountain and a fountain shop and where you can go and you know people in your community, you know people in your neighborhood. We're just in a very different place on life. Because when you take everything to go, you lose something more. It's not just the waste that you're creating. It's a connection that you're missing, the chance to sit down and have coffee with someone, right? Or and share I'd, a meal. Th that's, that's right. And I don't know that, it's, that we lose something. Mm -hmm. I, I think the paradigms have just shifted pretty dramatically. So when you think about how bad traffic is or how many people there are on this planet, when you think about what you do in your daily life, just think about a day in the life of you. From the moment you wake up until when you go to bed, 
are there things that you could have shifted slightly? Maybe it makes you slow down a little bit more. Maybe it just makes you rethink your choices that you're making. And maybe it causes you to want to sit down and have that cup of coffee in a for here cup and take a little bit, just take a moment and to realize when you walk away from social media, the world is still <laughs> on fire. <laughs> Not a whole lot's changed and nobody missed you all that much. But you have this that This is moment. a very important point. <laughs> it's a very important point. Um, so, so I just think it's like, yeah. I wouldn't, I just wouldn't, I would caution us against saying we have to go back or it has to be one way. I think this is a great opportunity to say, what can it become? Let's rethink. Let's rethink and are it. there elements from the past? Are there totally new things? Like how do we remix this scenario? So let's actually, like, let's put this in context. Like how, how, how big of a problem have we created? So um, what are these? These are plastic resin pellets, also affectionately known as nurdles. These are nurdles. But I have to say my polymer chemists laugh at me when they first heard nurdle. Like I it's thought, a ridiculous word. I thought it word. was a nurdle, and they were like, that's not what we call it. These are resin pellets. And I was like, oh, okay. I hadn't learned that, you know, I, we had always called it a nurdle in this space. Yeah. So anyway. So this is like the foundational element of plastic. So plastic, every, the bottles and everything you see, it starts as nurdles of the different colors and densities and stuff like that. Um, so it's the building block. And so what do we do with that? What happens next? So... Yeah, so I mean, those are what get melted down and formed into all of the things that I don't know if the chairs you're sitting on are plastic or not, but Computer um, yeah, yeah, the case we've got the nice wood ones for one the photo thing, up here. One thing I encourage my students to do um, is to record everything that you touch in 24 hours that's plastic, even if you don't repeat the item. So once you've listed it once, you don't have to write it down again because when I first say this, they're like, oh, <laughs> and it's it's. Yeah, I mean, it's overwhelming. And then there's also things that you don't realize that are plastic, that are really plastic, that you'll miss on the list. Um, but that's always a very eye-opening experience. So that relates to this curve. This is the... So 1950 yep. here through 2050 projected. Um, that's what we call an exponential growth curve. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was only about 2 million metric tons in 1950. And as I said, that was really when it entered. That's when we just started recording the data. That's when it entered the marketplace after the war. So we have now, um, the next three slides are infographics from Dr. Jambeck's three science papers. She's a very good scientist. Um, well, this is science advances, but yes, yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it okay. Yeah, I mean, so I think these numbers really um, came across pretty loud and clear when we published this. And so looking at that growth curve, that was annual um, production. And then we looked at that cumulatively. So cumulatively, by 2017, we had produced 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic. So again, just since 1950. And I mean... I work in millions and billions of, of quantities of things, but still extremely hard to imagine that, you know, when we hear that number, what does that really mean? And then we can, so we converted it. One of the conversions is 80 million blue whales, still impossible to imagine. So I know we just, we really can't comprehend that number, but I think what's more illustrative is that because 40% of this is used for packaging and single use items, probably even more than that, combining those two. It means that the majority of that had already become waste by 2015. So by 2015, 6.3 billion metric tons had become waste already that we had to manage somehow on this planet. And then the other statistics, um, one that became statistic of the year, um, and Wait, who, who anoints the statistic of the year? from the UK. It was like the, the Royal Statistical Society. I love this. I believe. I love this. All I know, <laughs> all I know is I had to do a CNN interview because of that. <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was one of those. I mean, they had some different categories. I think other ones were like people's social media things. Mm -hmm. we're talking was about this like media. the grand prize Royal Statistic of the year? Um, I think so. Yeah. So I mean, it, I mean, it really went to goes to show you that it's it's been very challenging, as I said, to manage this material in the waste stream yeah. with only nine percent of it recycled. That's what I was just going to point out. So um, nine percent of plastic, both globally and the similar percentage for the U.S., right. actually Those gets are. recycled. 
Yeah, so it is a global average, meaning on the local scale and on the country level, obviously, it could vary. But yeah, uh, in terms of our cumulative global average, it's only 9%. We're currently blowing it. Yeah. Like we invented the material that lasts forever, and we're just throwing it away. Yeah, so that means almost 80%. Um, is ending up either in our landfills or the open environment. So when you look at these numbers and look at what's ending up in the environment, actually those percentages are fairly small, even though those quantities are huge mm -hmm. as well. I mean, it, it truly is a lost commodity, right? So we have, we've created this material. We've extracted from the earth to be able to create this material. And we've used this material. We've made a lot of money selling products in this material. And then we've thrown the material away without even thinking that it has value. And that's both an industry issue, but it's also a consumer issue, right? So there's a lot more material that we could actually innovate around, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Yeah. And, and this is where I think that opportunity to innovate really is so strong, because that's a ton of material. It's more than a ton. It's like, <laughs> uh, it's 34 billion metric tons. And yeah. it's, <laughs> it's billions of tons. Um, so break this down for us a little. What are we looking at here from your next yeah, paper? Yeah, so I think, um, so what we're talking about here is the challenging of man challenge of managing this material. And um, what we saw was this was also another sort of perfect storm as we were talking about before with the increase in plastic use um, and the challenging with infrastructure. What we also did in the US was create single stream recycling, made it pretty easy for us. I still think people are fairly confused even by single stream, but like you put it all in one recycle bin. We environmental engineers design facilities to separate that material out. Unfortunately, if it's not source separated, it's very hard to get clean commodities out of that. At the same time in the early 90s, the WTO was really encouraging global trade. China, the manufacturing hub of the world, needed material. So many of our commodities coming out of our material recovery facilities started going to China, um, and they were using it for manufacturing. And that became a, 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 so that's this a big blue line here with our exports. Yes, so our exports from the US, so um, that's that quantity, and then the blue imports from China, um, which, I, yeah, they're different color blue, so you can see that. So what, so what we were doing is basically just relying on China importing these materials. And that's how everyone was feeling really good about putting their recyclables in the recycle bin. So China was taking our trash for a while. Mm -hmm. And they they decided not to do that anymore. That's right. So that so, kind of set things in a tizzy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a, a huge... Was that like a 50s word? I like say <laughs> the 50s and I start saying tizzy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, this cascade impact sort of up you know, the economic system of recycling, all the way to us in the kitchen going, oh, my, you know, county just told me I can't recycle glass anymore because they can't afford to recycle it. Um, and so China was basically, first of all, not wanting to have the environmental pollution from managing that imported waste, and then also wanting to develop their own domestic waste infrastructure and rely on their own um, commodity in terms of recycled materials. So we're shipping plastic back and forth all over the world. Um, and some of it is going into the ocean. So this was the paper that I read that got me introduced to your work. Um, you created this first global estimate of how much of this plastic is ending up in the ocean. So explain to us, like, how did you figure that out? How did you know how much of the production ended up in the sea? Um, so it was, it, it definitely was a challenge, and this was in um, a working group. So this scientific working group um, out of NC's UC Santa Barbara. So amazing collaboration with other scientists from around the world, which was really great. Um, but we, you know, we asked that question because people were finding plastic everywhere, and you know, it, it seemed almost this anecdotal thing as opposed to like you know, a science that we could really start to address. We're like, well, how much is actually going in? We knew that probably the waste that we create every day, this is something that I had connected when I first heard about plastic and waste ending up in our ocean. I'm like, well, we should, we're, we must be doing something wrong on land for that to happen. Um, and so that's where that connection came. And so we looked at 192 countries in the world, countries and economies in the world that have a coastline, um, thinking about, well, proximity of waste that doesn't get managed properly matters. And so within a 50 kilometer buffer, how much um, waste is generated, how much of that is plastic, 
and then how much of that is mismanaged, and that's made up of two components. One is inadequately managed waste, and the other is litter. Inadequately managed waste is waste that's not managed um, in a formal waste management system, and we use sort of some proxies of data um, to represent that and built a model to predict that mismanaged waste. Most of this data came from a World Bank report um, that had come out just before we sort of completed this analysis. And so um, what we came up with then at that final, um, we came up with three sort of inputs, low, medium, and high, with the mid input being 8 million metric tons of plastic going into the ocean every year. Um, and, that and that breaks down to about a ton every four seconds. Well, you've done some math. I maybe did that <laughs> math. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't done that. There's a few ways to visualize that. Too, I like, couldn't get my head around this 8 yeah, million tons exactly. number, but Dune and I talked about this, and, and if you break it down to the second, it's a sure. ton every four seconds, which is yeah. just like an emptying dump truck. Right, into so that, the ocean. yeah, we usually say, yeah, dump truck a minute um, as one way to kind of visualize it. It's a lot. It, <laughs> it's a lot. Um, so, what does this, what does this, what, what does this do? To the food web, right? We've got like animals in this diagram of the ocean. How does that plastic sort of get get involved in that part? So, I mean, I think the two most well-known interactions with animals has been ingestion and entanglement. Um, we know that seabirds, even plastic gets colonized by microbes that then makes it smell like food for seabirds. Um, and, you know, animals are curious and they interact with this, you know, material in the environment. And now we know, though, that even the smallest animals in our food web, so the zooplankton at the bottom of the food chain can consume plastic that's small enough for them to eat. Um, and and so then it sort of bioaccumulates up the food chain. Dune, has that, like, has that led to people being more concerned about this because of, like, personal health? So I know as someone who's designing these like really strategic campaigns or how to engage the public on these issues, has, has health impacts of plastic exposure been something that's really driven people's concern or interest? So I should explain my PhD at this point. Please do. <laughs> what kind of doctor are you? I'm a psychologist <laughs> by training. Um, and so we, we spend a lot of time thinking about somebody's emotional response to a situation and, and cognitively, what can we actually handle as a species? Um, come to find out it's not that much that we can handle. So while I would like to think that when people hear, you're probably drinking water because water fibers have been found in every sample of water taken around the world. and Plastic fibers. Plastic yeah. fibers, sorry. And uh, you're probably seasoning with it because sea salt samples have shown some plastic in it as well. And if you eat seafood, especially if you live in the UK and you eat shellfish, you're probably eating 11,000 particles of plastic every single year. Um, I'd like to think that those stats move us to want a different environment for ourselves. And it, I, I just don't think that it does, yeah. partly because it's too big. I mean, that is really heavy to think about. And then you see the studies around it's in the air because now it's just floating around. So it's raining it's plastic. It's kind of everywhere. Yeah. It's in the highest mountains, it's in the deepest part of the Mariana Trench. It's really everywhere right now. And so as a, as a mom of a five-year-old, I think about it every single time my child actually rejects seafood because at home, we talk about fish nibbling on plastic. So he no longer oh, wow. eats seafood. So there's an entire generation of kids that are coming forward that know how to compost, they know how to recycle, they just expect it. My child brings plastic home from school, from his Montessori school, to make projects at home. I'm more trash in my house right now than I know what to do with <laughs> because they're just bringing it home because they, he knows to reuse it. But no, I, I think we have to boil it down to things that are much, much simpler for people to understand and where they can actually feel like they can make a difference. Mm -hmm. They can make a different choice. I can't choose which air I breathe. I actually can't choose which water I drink. And it's hard for me to fathom a world where I can, I can determine whether or not that fish or that oyster has been in an environment where there has been plastic in its environment. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, it's everywhere. And so as a consumer, as a person, it's really hard, one, to understand it, two, to make a choice to pay attention to it long enough to do something different about it, mm -hmm. and then three, to even know what to do at all. 
Yeah. Where do you start? And that's like a lot to I'm expect to your of farm. a consumer. I'm, email your mom. I mean, we have 150 chickens, so 40 <laughs> is too many for you. Don't come to my farm. Um, so let's, but what does this look like? So Jenna, tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here. <clears throat> so this is um, one of the largest dump sites in the world. And um, I, I visit these kind of facilities all over the world. Um, many times I travel with um, the International Informational Speakers Program with the State Department, and that's taken me to 13 different countries. But this is the front lines. This is the front lines, you know. I mean, we also have landfills in the U.S. I mean, this is especially striking because it really illustrates the millions of people around the world who informally work with um, managing our waste. Yeah. And, and so I think... So that's what this is, right? And this as well. So um, this, is, this is a country that has imported um, material to process for recycling. And the, mm -hmm. yeah, I just think as we think about solutions, which I know we'll kind of get into, I just think it's so important that we understand that it's, you know, we talk a lot about numbers, but it's people. It's people There's behind all of these numbers. There's a whole sector of the economy that's trying to fig that's dealing with processing this waste. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we want to be in inclusive of people who, I mean, these are the experts. Yeah. This is true. That is not said often enough. Um, so, meanwhile, back in America, this is my expert. <laughs> <laughs> so, Adrian Grenier, actor, was one of the founders of Lonely Whale. Um, and so, Dune, tell us what we're seeing here. So, we, we were fortunate to go to Bali, Indonesia uh, in February of 2017 and launch for the UN Environment the Clean Seas Campaign. And while we were there, we decided with one of our dear friends, Sean Heinrichs, well, let's go out and let's swim with the mantas. These beautiful, gigantic, pelagic mantas that come up in this cleaning station and they bring their young in and it's really an idyllic situation. So this photo is taken uh, on the coast of Sanur, which is just outside of Bali. And, and right there on the beach, not where the beautiful resorts are, but where the everyday people live their lives. Right there on the beach is probably about three, three and a half feet deep, thick of waste, right on the coast. What you can't see from here are all of the artisanal fishers who are right out there catching their daily catch, catching for their families, catching for their communities, catching for their business. Um, and at the time, we were gearing up our, our, our campaign with Starbucks. So we had been working with Starbucks. We had seen these green straws everywhere. <laughs> and it literally just, and, and it's a trademark color. So it, these are the Starbucks straws on the coast of Sonora, right there on the beach. And so Adrian just put his hand down in the sand and pulled these up. Everywhere we looked, we could have seen the green straws and the plastic bags and the cups. We got on the, the dive boat, went out, to the, the cleaning station the entire way out, the entire water column. Uh, it actually, it was 2016, no, 2017. The entire water column down that you could see, as far down as you could see, was trash. Styrofoam coolers in the distance. An hour off of the coast, you could see trash all the way down in the water column. And what Sean and a friend of ours from Conservation International said is this must be, this must be weird. Like there's some weird currents, We've never seen anything like this before. Um, so we kept going out. We dove with the mantas. We snorkeled and dove with the mantas. And, and there was so much trash, we were compelled to just put as much trash under our rash guards as we possibly could. And there was a point at which you realized, it just doesn't matter what I do right now. I can't collect enough of this plastic. And you watch the pelagic mantas swim through it and have their, their young come into the cleaning station. So we, we capture some of the best content that we use a lot still in a lot of our, our marketing work. Uh, but it really struck us, especially when it was really difficult to get back to the boat because you had to swim through the trash mm -hmm. to get back to the boat. This is an hour off the coast. There's no civilization around. Where is this trash coming from? Right? It occurred to us that the problem is so big and so great that we really have to try to find a way to simplify this issue for the everyday average person, or we're not gonna make a hill of beans worth of difference. So tell us about your marketing approach. So Lonely Whale is a nonprofit, and you have this very, I would say, unique approach to running your campaigns. We're gonna, we're gonna get a little 
um, some views into their actual work coming up in a second, but just give us the context for how you think through how to talk about this stuff. So it, it started when I worked for a really, really big thinker named Paul Allen, who owned a company called Vulcan. And I helped start Vulcan Philanthropy. And while there, ocean was one of my major thematic focus areas. And, and we really had a very difficult time finding a way into the plastic space. And this was just before your paper had come out. But it, the ocean issues are so large. And, and really, at the end of the day, Paul boiled it down into a very specific statement that really has driven me completely, even to this moment. And, and that statement is, if nobody cares for the ocean, it doesn't matter. Because he knew as a billionaire, he could just keep, he could pump all $18 billion into policy change and market-based solutions and campaigns. But at the end of the day, if we don't really actually start acknowledging that there's an ocean or that we depend on it, it kind of doesn't matter. So I left Vulcan, met Adrian and his producing partner, Lucy, who had just stood up Lonely Well a few months before, and realized that, I, I don't say this very often, but I found kindred spirits um, in wanting to do things differently. So if we have, I think the estimate is something like 20,000 environmental NGOs globally who have been fighting on the front lines and fighting the good fight for a long time, but we still see our oceans in decline, maybe we could do things a little bit differently. Worth a shot. Worth a shot. Let's give it so a go. So let's take a look at... Yeah, and so leveraging Adrian's acting and storytelling and Lucy's storytelling as well, we decided, well, let's leverage the talents of professional brand marketing agencies. Mm -hmm. Why not put forward marketing campaigns the exact same way that a brand would? And in doing so, can we wake people up? Can we get people to pay attention that there's an environmental issue that we have to deal with and that there's an ocean out there that we all depend on? So, so that's really where the quest started from is, can we do it differently? And can we do it like brands do it every day that tell you, you need those shoes. You don't know why you need those shoes, but a brand has figured out how to market those shoes to you before you even knew that you, needed, that you had feet <laughs> and you're getting ready to buy some shoes. <laughs> so that's really where our quest came from. But we had to start And with, you started, you had to start somewhere and you started with straws. We started with straws, yeah. And uh, then this happened. <laughs> well, so we decided, you know, we were looking at how do we get people to care for the ocean. We decided thematically to focus on plastic pollution because, as Jenna said, we come into contact with single-use plastic every single day. It's the one thing that aligns every one of us. We don't necessarily know how to deal with slavery on the high seas or uh, deep sea mining or <laughs> oil spills or seismic blasting. Those are really big, heavy, heady issues. But single-use plastic packaging, like we can get our arms wrapped around that. So we decided to do some research to figure out what do people pay attention to. Lo and behold, in 2016, uh, this was the most popular Instagram of all time. This is Selena Gomez sucking on a straw. Number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten also had beautiful women sucking on a straw. What? <laughs> okay, maybe number seven wasn't. <laughs> But it was I remarkable. I didn't know about the rest of the list. No, no, no. Jeez. It was remarkable. And so we thought, OK, well, this is the enemy. Like, this is what we're oh up against. God. And what we realized is that, again, without us even knowing it, while we were asleep at the wheel, plastic and sucking through plastic became sexy. And yes, she's beautiful, and she was very popular. But it's the act of sucking through that straw. And if we're going to combat this, then we have to do something really, really, really clever. So we hired an agency to help us out. <laughs> um, oh, and then, OK, fast forward. We'll, we'll come back to this in a second. Um, did anybody in here remember the scuttlebutt associated with the Fiji Water Girl? Was this at the Grammys or the Emmys, Emmy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Oscars, one of, those, one of those shows. This was from a, if, if I'm in marketing and advertising at Fiji Water, I'm getting a massive bonus this year because she photobombed every single celebrity. This was, un, this was earned media for Fiji water that cost them nothing. They hired a model. She stood there with a the silver tray or glass tray. She had some Fiji plastic water bottles on it. She is in every single <laughs> celebrity photo that year, every single one. And what was funny about it is our team's looking at this going, 
why didn't we think about that? With a non-plastic single-use plastic water bottle, we should have thought about oh, that. Oh, they were making like stainless silver holders for them at clubs. Oh, yeah. It was like that shape. They're of all the over the place. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. But then again, we also realized that if we're going to tackle the issue of not paying attention to this thing that has come into our lives, we have to get really clever. So I think we're going to show a couple of PSAs. Yeah. Okay. We've got a video. So the first one is our straw campaign that we did that I think probably many of you probably saw. Oh. Oh, no, we're not going to do that we, yet. Okay, <laughs> so real quick. We're, we're apparently going to show you two okay, more well, graphs gonna, because this is science and, and society. <laughs> So as an organization, um, we're extremely data-driven, and, and we pay really close attention to the trends. So in addition to looking at what the marketing teams are doing, right, because that shows us what we, what we have to combat, we're also paying attention to what it matters to us. So this is a Google Trends analysis showing us from the year 2014 over here all the way up until April, well, the kind of right where we are right now in 2019, um, the trend associated with um, uh, basically Googling plastic pollution. And what's interesting about this is that we started Googling it a little bit back in 2014, and then there's a couple of spikes. So this is last year's uh, World Ocean Summit, World Ocean Week, where there was a tremendous amount of activity <coughs> that uh, over media and social media that was continuing to raise awareness about plastic pollution. June 8th, every year, World Oceans Day. Start planning now for 2020. But, and this but don't do a was, marketing campaign on that day. It was hosted in India. So, I mean, yeah. a very populous country. It was hosted in India, and, and there, were some, there were some very specific policy changes that came out of that. India basically saying, we're going to ban, and all of us going, well, that's going to be hard. Let's see how it works out. They've actually reversed in a couple of cases. Um, but the other thing that we do is we, we look across how, what people are Googling um, to see, well, what happened? And why are these inflection points here? And there's a couple of inflection points that I want to point out to you because it's not that any one organization has really shifted the narrative. It's that all of us together have shifted the narrative. And we all work very, very closely with each other, not on the timing and when we're going to release things, but just how we're all raising awareness and consciousness together. So a couple things I want to point out. One is the Clean Seas campaign from the UN environment um, created an inflection point. Strangely enough, our strawless ocean uh, I, I created a decline in interest, I guess. <laughs> uh, Blue Planet 2 with the Ocean X team is here, um, wh who, massive contributor to that, created an inflection point. And, and I, I just want to pause on this one for a second because if we just looked at that by itself, we would say, eh, you know, it's kind of like Stralis Ocean. It created a little bit of a blip, but nothing significant. I actually think it was one of the most significant inflection points because Sir David Attenborough, realized and started talking to the Queen of England and every policymaker around the world, this has got to change, was his message. And you don't argue with Sir David Attenborough. Um, and then there was Earth Day, the Nat Geo Plastic versus Planet, and then the Beat Plastic Pollution campaign that has come out as well. Um, so all of these matter, but importantly, and then we can move on from this, is if you look at the interest over here, and this is really the concentration in search, we have gone from roughly 19% or 19% interest in this um, as a floor to above 50% now. And that's only trending higher. So it's people understand the issue more, right? They know to pay attention to it, which means as a campaigner, it's much, much more complex. And the audience with the level of maturity is demanding things that are even more exceptional and allow them to pay attention to the issue than we've ever seen before. And I think you'll see that in our two PSAs and how we've shifted our tone and how we've shifted our direction of it as well. So here's the, between the PSAs. Now. Yes, I think so. So here's the first one. I suck. I may not look like I suck, but I do. Ban Jones sucks. I've been sucking on TV since I was 10. Everybody could suck, I would suck. I've sucked in over 90 countries. Democrats, Republicans, independents, we all suck. You know who else sucks? Kendrick Sampson. <laughs> I'm Kendrick Sampson and I suck. We suck together. Sure, I've sucked, but Yuna sucks even more. Yuna sucks. And I suck. And I suck. And I suck. When someone tweets, I suck, I'm like, I know. Statistically speaking, most of us suck. Most of us suck every day. Suck, suck, suck. Suck. Today, you probably used one of these. 
500 million plastic straws are used in this country every single day. And many end up in the ocean, polluting water and killing sea life. If we don't act now, by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. You know, like you go snorkeling, you look down, and you don't see fish, you see plastic. But there's something you can do about I it. I will stop sucking. I will stop sucking. We will all stop sucking. We will all stop sucking. If you do. Hashtag stop sucking. Ken Jones, was, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. So how was this received? What happened? I, within the first three months of the campaign, uh, I know we say the word viral a lot, so I'll just give you the stats from us. We had over 150 million social media impressions. It was in uh, more than 35 countries. It was natively localized in 40 languages. Um, that was in the first three months. So it, what it did, I think, is it gave people license to change. The thing about the straw that was so simple for those who don't need a straw, and there is a very important population in our society that needs straws to drink, plastic straws to drink. But for those who don't, all, it's so simple. All you have to do is just stop sucking on a single-use plastic straw. It's that easy. It's actually really hard because people just keep giving them to you. <laughs> no matter how many times you say no straw, they just keep coming still yeah. today. But we saw policy change in communities all over the world. We still do. Corporate policy change, government policy change. But importantly for us, uh, and we always say that the straw campaign wasn't about the straw. The straw campaign was it about an awakening, an awakening that there is an ocean out there. Uh, but secondly, that we use a lot of plastic. And what we found is that people were like, yeah, 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 the straw. But what about the bobblehead doll that is given out at 30, at 30 games a year across all 32 teams, and they, on average, give out about 30,000 of them. They're encased in plastic that can't be recycled, typically, and then styrofoam. What about that? And that's a great question. That's so exactly it's this what we're opportunity to get people to think about what they do and do not need. That's right. So there's yeah. the science that underpins it. There's a cultural campaign, and then there's this conversation about like what's the policy change. So how can how can how do you think about the connection between science and policy and culture? Like, are is it a, a straight line, or is it sort of like circular? What's sort of the relationship between those three in your experience? Um, well, for me, I, I think I've, it's, I've had amazing opportunities. I'm very grateful for my opportunities to communicate my science to policymakers. Um, and I think, you know, it has been embraced, I think, by all people kind of working on this issue to have numbers to act, you know, and to, to really understand a bit more um, about sources, because ultimately when we think about how we want this issue to stop, zero plastic in the ocean, we need to think about, you know, all those places along the way. I think where the nuances come in and where the most provocative conversations are is when we talk about where those interventions mm -hmm. need to be. And that's where we have some disagreement, but I feel like everybody sort of agrees all over the world. We don't want plastic in our ocean. We don't want it on our coastline. And so you can start there in terms of your conversations um, in any culture. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. The, the only thing I would add to that is, is, you know, policymakers need to know that the market, their constituents are going to be supportive of a policy change because policy is hard enough to make, yeah. let alone make it stick. And what we really saw with our campaign, and we're not a policy shop, we don't have scientists, these are my two go-to gals all the time. <laughs> but what we knew we could offer in this conversation was a fun, lighthearted campaign where you could just stop using single-use plastic straws. And it turns out in the city of Seattle, within one month, we saved over two million single-use plastic straws. And, and within the first week of our Strawless in Seattle campaign, which came out right around the same time as that Stop Sucking PSA, uh, the city of Seattle came in and said, cool, you've got a lot of restaurateurs. We had over 150 individual establishments, including the first airport in the country, to go single-use plastic straw free. And they said, great, that's good enough for us. We're going to shift our policy then. And so we're you got all of these businesses to sign up, and the government was like, sure, we'll make this permanent. Yeah, we'll make it permanent. Why not? Sounds like fun. And we'll Can throw, we throw in single-use plastic utensils <laughs> while we're at it. Yeah, single-use plastic straws and utensils, because what they needed to know was that there was an alternative in the market that these businesses could rely on at the right price point. That is critical. 
Without that, this change doesn't happen that quickly. And we know enough in the single-use plastic packaging side of the equation, we just don't have as many alternatives as we need right now. So this is obviously more than straws, as we've already discussed. Um, let's zoom out a little bit. Oh, wait, sorry, more oh. straws. <laughs> so, so just to show you like how pervasive this was in culture, right? We've got Kim Kardashian... Instagram storying that and Calabasas has banned straws. And we knew we made it then. Whenever and the, this West, Instagram the West household out, we, is on board we with abandoning straws. We were in. We knew culturally. <laughs> but it was the memes. It was when, and I, look, I am not, I'm not a marketing professional. I wasn't a marketing professional before taking this job at Lonely Whale. But what, I've, what I pay attention to now are the memes. How many memes do I have? Uh, who's using those memes? Where are they going? And this was the funniest. Like, the black market plastic straws. <laughs> like, that was awesome. I have to say, when The Onion did a parody of my science paper, I knew I had you made knew. it too. You knew. I was like, what? I'm in The Onion? That's the best. It was like, OK, NPR, New York CNN. Times, but The Onion. onion. <laughs> Then I'm getting, it, I'm getting the word out. <laughs> One day, I'll, I'll just dream about that day. Um, so, so Jenna, tell us, so you've done this really foundational science to helping us understand how big the problem is, like what's actually driving the problem. Um, what's, what's happening next? What's, what are we looking, who's your team? What's happening at National Geographic? Yeah, so, um, so I'm, I'm now co-leading the Sea to Source expeditions um, for National Geographic, and I'm really getting to sort of combine a lot of my loves in terms of being able to do this work um, on a research basis. But I've kind of changed from um, sort of some of these big picture global analyses, which which I'm still doing, I should say, I've just added to it, um, getting down to the community level because as I showed you, the, the front lines of this work are in our communities and it is still ultimately um, the municipalities that usually bear the burden and then the citizens within that community of managing waste. And so collecting our data um, sort of at that stage has been something that I've really wanted to do. And this also was sort of born out of doing some of the travel um, with the State Department to many of these countries, which I would go to communities within there and we'd sit down and I would talk about the science and, and they would say, okay, um, well, great, now we know this is an issue, what should we do? And um, not to dodge the question, but I would say, look, you, you know your community, you know your um, situation, your culture, all of that much better than I, but here's sort of what I see, and that has turned into sort of a framework for data collection that you can do collaborative with a community, because um, ultimately I, th I believe that data empowers you to make choices, and so being able to understand their situation better from the data side, and then all the knowledge, local knowledge that they already have, combine those to figure out you know, what can we do here? And even, you know, a bigger systems change because if they can't do what they want to do, then you need to figure out how the system changes so that you can. So that's, I encourage people to advocate. Your choice matters, but if you can't make those choices, if they are so hard, our society is so sped up. If you do slow down, you feel like everybody's running by. I mean, I don't, it's, I, it's so sped up. Um, so I think that, um, if you want to, to slow down and make some of those choices, what, what with the system has to change and can you, who do you want to communicate that to? Government, corporations, you know, your fellow citizens. That's, that's such a great point, especially in the context of people see a straw campaign and they are like, well, what does it matter what I do, right? And so the thing that's really interesting is how does you know, individual awareness or behavior change plus the science and the sharing of data actually lead to the systems change that we're seeking, right? Like you're both thinking, like you're talking to individuals and you're doing like small data collection or like reaching individuals, but it's not about like, your goal in life is not to get me to stop using a straw. Like, I, I, I'm on board, but like, that's not, that's not the game, right? Um, so how, tell us just a tiny bit more about the, the Planet or Plastic Initiative at National Geographic and your, your work leading that research and like what's, what's, what's that all about? Sure, I, I'd love to. Um, so my co-lead here, I'd love to acknowledge Heather Coldaway um, 
and even mention just a couple of things about the way we're doing this that's different, if possible. Um, the, you've never really heard of a lead of an expedition being two people, but we're actually two women with families, and we wanted to job share. So we're actually job sharing the lead of an expedition, um, which has been tremendous. And I think a big change had never happened at National Geographic. We're really... Um, really trying to change things. So, and also um, we're working collaboratively with people. So this is along the Ganges River um, in both Bangladesh and India, and we have in-country partners in both of those places. Um, and really working with folks and scientists there um, who have knowledge to bring and build capacity and, and there's learning on both sides. So the Planet or Plastic campaign is actually through Nat Geo's media arm, so the partners um, which is different than the society. So the society is where we do the expeditions and collect the science. Um, but that campaign, um, I think, has been has seemed to be very successful. I mean, and it caused a blip on the graph. I know. I actually didn't know about it's quantifiably that. Quantifiably, they're going to be really happy. To, I'm sure they know about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it. And it was informed by science. I mean, I was asked a lot. Um, I mean, similar. You know, Dune will contact me, and I think that it's. It's great, and I think those campaigns that are based upon um, that carry more weight because I think people know when it's something like greenwashing or you know when they're kind of people are kind of just paying lip service to mm -hmm. something, and so I, I think that um, the citizens are savvy enough, and so I think it's important to build campaigns on you know data. So, um, given the panelists and this photograph, I have to ask, is, are there any men besides Adrian Grenier who work on this problem? There's a couple. <laughs> There's a few. I mean, is there, is, is there some reason that you think that, I mean, it really is, it's like really is women leading on both the science and the policy and the campaigns and the conservation, like... I mean, these are the, just the two best people. I wasn't like, I'm going to have a women-only panel. I was like, who are the two smartest people on this? And can I convince them to come to hang out That's in a warehouse That's how this picture came to be, too. Heather and I were like, okay, get going. We went back and picked our team and came together and were like, and these are the people that, I, you know, that we want, that we want to recruit, and they were all women. But there's, well, there are, don't fight it. You don't need to tokenize. There you know? are a few. There's a few. Yeah. You know, like yeah, there's, a, yeah, like Vaughn Hernandez. So that you know, if you look at the Break Free from Plastic movement as well, there's the, I got to give a shout out to the guys who are on the front lines, <laughs> um, and especially those who work really closely with the waste pickers. And and that is, it's a. It, you mentioned it earlier before, but I think it's worth mentioning again that those who are on the front lines of this, yes, they get paid a small amount of money for picking, but these are guys and gals who are out there every single day, mostly guys. A lot of women as well. Yeah. A lot of women. A lot of women. But at least the guys are organizing the waste pickers. They're the managers. <laughs> this is the problem. Well, we've yeah. seen a lot of women leaders within that space too, which I think. Yeah. Uh, but I do, th you know, I mean, we see that in, in environmental engineering some. Yeah. So women, um, you know, and this has been, I guess these are also sort of stereotypes, but in general they find that if it's something that we can care more about, um, we feel like it involves... Um, people, I mean, I guess I can, I like to do this more instead of generalizing, personally talk why I went into this and specifically went into solid waste. And it was because of people, the human dimension of this. It's not just, I mean, I found when I was in my design courses, so designing a wastewater treatment plant or a drinking water treatment plant, granted, they have these bigger picture, but it just felt very like, you know, okay, you know, concrete and AutoCAD and, you know, but when we talked about solid waste, I was like, wait, the people have to, first of all, define what is waste themselves, decide when it is, and then make all these choices. And then we have to design a system to actually manage it. And then don't forget, nobody wants it anywhere near them. Mm -hmm. They're producing it every day, but... You're like, it's the most complicated <laughs> problem. Yes. Our health and, like, security yep. are on the line. I'll just... I'll yeah. take the intractable one, please. Yep. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I'll take that one. Um, so here's your, your latest um, uh, approach to that, right? Tell us about the Marine Debris Tracker. So this is um, a citizen science platform, really. This is a mobile app. It's actually been out for a while, but it's it's reinvented itself in terms of a great facelift and or facelift, excuse me, and upgrade um, and some and some new partners that we're going to be able to announce really soon. And um, this is just it. 
it's actually how we collect data through our science with National Geographic and um, many partners around the world do collect data, but it's also available to any citizen in the world. And so as I was talking about, when you collect data in a community and that can empower you, I mean, this is basically um, a litter logger and there are other um, platforms to do this. So I encourage you, you know, to use any one. Ours um, is been around the longest, so I can say that. <laughs> um, and it was actually an idea that I had in New Hampshire when I was a professor up there and we did it first one on a PDA. So before smartphones even existed, we built the first version of this. Um, and so I, I, again, like if you are in a community and, and we're now holding a lot more trainings and education where you can um, figure out where you want to go, pick some transects and monitor that and really see what you're seeing leak out of your system, which is very, very, I mean, it's, it's different by culture and location for so many reasons. So it's almost like a litter personality of your community and then what can you do about that? A litter personality of your community. I did not make that term. So I, just, so I don't want to take like, credit for that. I like, I love it, but I think. There's like a different fingerprint of the waste from place to place, which and, obviously implicates the types of solutions yeah. or interventions. And it's become almost need. a forensics thing for us. Like during this process, yeah. it's like, where did this come from? Why is it, you know, what is this? Where did it come from and why is it here? Yeah. And then that can inform what you do. And so thinking beyond straws again, thinking beyond data, we're, we're in this scenario where even in these like beautiful remote places, we have bottles washing up on the beaches. And because waste, uh, because drinking water management is not what it should be, people are using more you know, plastic water bottles than they need to be. And, and there's a cultural, obviously, component to that too. So, um, so Dune, after, after you conquered the straw game, you were like, we're taking on water. Well, what was interesting is the head of Seattle Public Utilities at the launch of our Strawless in Seattle campaign said, well, this is interesting. Can you do for the plastic water bottle what you're about ready to do for the straw? And we were like, oh my God, we just need to get through the next month. And, <laughs> and our, at our culminating party, she asked us the same thing. Mm -hmm. Can you do for the plastic water bottle what you just did for the straw? And that began almost a year and a half research project in partnership with Point Break Foundation. And we were really curious because they're very different items. All of these little plastic items have their own unique personalities. They have their own histories. And so we spent a lot of time looking at single-use plastic water bottles. Come to find out, globally, we use 500 billion single plastic bottles. On average, depending on who you ask, roughly approximately, we recycle about 30% of those, give or take a few percentages, depending on where you are. Um, that's egregious. It's 500 billion that we use on an annual basis. And the stat that really stood out most for us is that in 2017, 26% of all new PET polymers produced were produced for the express purpose of the growing single-use plastic water bottle industry. Mm -hmm. So now the, the beverage industry has identified water as a growing area of interest for a lot of us, or that they could just sell it to us. We didn't know we were interested in single-use plastic water bottles, but we have a lot of them right now. And so this is the first time for us that, that as an organization, we connected it back directly to more oil and gas extraction and more money being put into the petrochemical industry, which is just growing by leaps and bounds. So plastic is made from fossil fuels. And I feel the need to just say like that because it's so easy to forget. You're like, it's plastic. Like, it's plastic. it was drilled it's out of oil. the ground. It's, it's oil. oil. Yeah. And there's a lot of chemicals in the production of it as well, which most of us don't have any idea. You know, we know intuitively we can say, yeah, plastic is from oil. Okay, got it, got it. Also natural gas. And natural gas. Which is yes, yes. Pick your fossil fuel and we'll make some <laughs> plastic out of it for you. But what we don't realize is the additives that go into it, all the chemicals and the effect that those chemicals and the, the processing and the petrochemical industry has on the communities where individuals live. Okay, this is really depressing. Let's watch your next so, PSA. Okay. <laughs> now, but in, in a year, and we did a national poll, so we really understood where we felt like our target audience was going to come from for this particular campaign. Um, but what we also realized in that Google Trends graph that I showed you is that people are much more savvy. So we couldn't do this lighthearted, oh, just stop sucking and everything will be fine campaign. It's ha, 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 ha. And this is in two years difference. This is in two years difference. We knew that it needed to be, had, had to have more texture to it. 
culturally, it had to resonate more. Um, and we needed a more diverse set of characters that were more millennial and Gen Z focused. So um, this won't surprise you probably. In this next PSA, I know like who two people are. And I didn't know it. anyone in the I literally had to ask about all the people in the last one, but they have millions of followers. Millions and millions of followers. We picked them very specifically because not only of how big their social media following is, but the engagement that these folks have and what they represent to individuals. Like my daughter, who was like, you got Diplo? which we'll see in this next PSA. All I right. don't barely know who Diplo is. <laughs> How do I hydrate? Plastic free, baby. Plastic free. Plastic water bottles only came into use in the 90s, and now we act like it's the only way we can drink water. 91% of plastic ever produced has not been recycled. I hydrate like I know plastic water bottles are among the top five most common items found in beach cleanups around the world. I hydrate like the planet is a beautiful place, and we want to keep it that way. I hydrate like I don't want to move to Mars. I hydrate like I will not let the plastic industry exploit us. I hydrate like plastic doesn't even go here. Hydrate like your mother taught you better. Like 500 billion plastic bottles are used around the globe annually. You don't have to use it, so, so why do it? Water bottles, don't use them. What? <laughs> Hydrate like a future with clean seas depends on it. Because if we don't change our ways, the ocean is expected to have more plastic than fish by 2050. Hydrate like you're on top of the world. Hydrate like the ocean, the planet, and future generations depend on it. Because we do. Just please. Stop using single-use plastic water bottles. So apparently this is what conservation groups do now. It's like so cool I don't even understand it. Um, but there are some Mean Girl fans out there and you know who you are. <laughs> um, so tell us about this. Like what's, what's next? Like is this having an impact? This just launched a few months ago. Yeah, so we launched this PSA and the campaign um, just a couple of days before World Ocean Day here in New York. We had a Museum of Plastic down in Soho on Broadway. We had uh, the President and the General Assembly for the UN come and launch it with us, which was really special for us. The UN has been a really important partner for us in all the work we do. And then we launched the PSA. So just a few months into it, we have... We've got some images of... Oh, do we have images? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got a meme. <laughs> You told me, I told you I'm really excited about the meme. Oh. We have some funny. <laughs> okay, so that's that's adorable. Um, but what I, can watch this all day. I know I can watch it all day as well. Um, but what we what we've seen with the campaign is we have over 45 NGOs globally participating in this campaign. So we leverage our NGO network pretty extensively, um, and we've really been able to reach a very significant social media audience. Um, we've got a lot of work to do though, because this is this is an industry that is really entrenched. What I'm very excited about though is just this summer. Um, after the launch, and we'll see an image in a couple of seconds, but after the launch of one of our partners who provides water in a screw top aluminum can, um, we saw both Pepsi and Coca-Cola announce a shift from single use plastic bottles for water to aluminum. Yeah. And aluminum is infinitely recyclable. There's, you know, 75% of all the aluminum ever extracted is still in the market today. So there's a, a significant opportunity to kind of push That's more huge. towards that market. That's huge. 70% of 75 the aluminum is still like it's being... Still, yeah, it's still being recirculated As today. opposed to the water bottles. And then th there is this cultural shift happening where, for example, San Francisco Airport just said, we're not selling any more plastic bottled water. So they're needing to find new products for that. Um, but this is just to give us a little context about the climate impacts, right? Because like there's a huge amount of... Um, We've got some stats for us. Plastics will account for 20% of oil consumption by 2050. That's just insane. Um, and 
I might just stop there. I mean, that's, and that's just bad. like, that's really bad. We've got a lot more facts, but um, I think that's the most important one. And that we're actually, by 2025, which is just a few years away, production capacity will increase around 33%. So we're actually gearing up to produce more as people are scaling back their use of fossil fuels for other purposes. These same corporations are doubling down on plastics production and creating, what are there, 264 new plastic production facilities for the US alone that are slated to come online. I mean, just when I published, it was 275, the production number, they, their new report just came out. It's 355, I believe, we just crossed the three, 350 million metric tons of plastic being produced every year, and that does not include fibers. So you need to add fibers to that, which we'll we have did. to have a separate year. event on like microplastics and microfibers. So there's just like so yeah. much going I on. I mean, just the plastic that's produced to make fabric yeah. is what that means. So it's actually more, much more than that as well. So, um, Dune, I have two campaign ideas for you. Awesome. Um, I am not a marketer. So, um, dating apps with the swiping, <laughs> swipe left on plastic. Uh -huh. Like every, all these people have like a picture of themselves drinking out of a single use plastic scenario. I'm like, why would you think that's your best foot forward and someone would want to date you? <laughs> is it, can we, is this, does this have legs? <laughs> completely doable, <laughs> yeah, completely doable. In fact, the, uh, so the Lonely Well that we're named after a couple years ago, there was an article that talked about how the Lonely Well calls out for companionship never to hear a call back. Been living his life in the ocean by himself for a long time. And, and this, this one very sassy writer said, or they're calling out a lot because they just keep getting lucky and we're like, open a Tinder account. Like that's what we have to do is open a Tinder account for this lonely whale and then oh people can swipe left if you're lonely or like the whale or... No, I, I think anything that we can do to... <laughs> we, we, we call it hacking pop culture. Yeah anything that we can do to just like, just get it in there, right? Yeah. So it's not something on top of what you do on a daily basis. You, oh yeah, you just swipe left, or I don't know if it's left or right, I've been married for a long time, I'm not <laughs> I sure know. which one it is. Which one this is, is it? foreign, but here's, let me, let me tell you where I just did it, which this was fun, I, I, I actually tweeted this as left. well. No, 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 I have no idea, I mean, I, I know, because I've heard people talk about it, but I don't know. <laughs> I know people that are, I'm getting really laughed at, okay. So, but Hashtag is, swipe left on I, plastic. That's all I'm saying. I like it. Um, so I was playing Roblox with my 11-year-old son. So made a, a character there. Um, and anyway, so they're playing this dragon game, and you get to be a dragon. And so I made myself Blue Ocean. And then I basically said, is peaceful unless you litter plastic in the ocean? Like, you can do your description. I thought... All these people playing Roblox, you read the description, so it was like peaceful unless you drop trash in the ocean and then becomes, you know, you know, will basically, I don't know if it would hurt you, but you know, <laughs> will be upset and then collects data on plastic and I don't know, it was, okay, I've got I had one to put the data one. thing in there. I've got so another pop one. culture is all I was saying, I was like, yeah. I got another way one. to do it. Double D. Double Ds, do your dishes. Because I feel like all of this like, no. That's amazing. Too, too, too edgy. I feel like we're in this scenario where like people are using disposables so they don't want to wash their dishes. All these cafes don't even have the capacity in the dishwasher to like mm -hmm. do the dishes. But like do your damn dishes. Like it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. She's like less interested in that one. Okay, we'll keep working on no, that one. No, I'm taking notes. We'll keep working on that one. Um, speaking of which, we have this like this, right? This is like compostable plastic. Um, people are using this as the alternative because we still don't want to do our dishes because it's like a lot of dishes. Um, what, what's the deal with this? Is this any better? Should we feel good about this? This only depends to me. Well, first of all, it, if this is PLA, corn-based polymer, which is really the only one that is, um, has enough of a market share to, for people to be seeing it, um, it will not biodegrade if it's littered or ends up in the ocean, for sure, because it has to reach a temperature of about 50 degrees C to reach hydrolysis, and then the microbes can access the carbon. This is my favorite science answer to this question. 
This is awesome. This, and then, is, this is what you're here for. This is amazing. So then, um, but if you, but it will biodegrade then in an industrial compost system. So when people hear compostable, they're like, oh, home compostable. Nope. It has this to go to that. will be in your that. backyard for like a century. Yeah. It just would, it would be yeah. the same as a traditional polymer, really. So, but what it is, is it's not made from fossil fuels. So if that's something you care about and you do have access to industrial composting, then it could be maybe an alternative. But again, it, in terms of the leakage, that component, it, it's no different. So, um, but there are other bi truly biodegradable polymers that are out there and people using things like lignin and cellulose, again, sort of circling back, but with more technology that we have now, things like nanocellulose mm -hmm. and other things that you can use to build structures that then could potentially be, you know, what we're looking at if you want that. But again, still needs to be managed properly, just like food waste. Yeah. yeah. Um, so on the flip side, we've got this thing. This is what you were talking about before. This is the aluminum can for water. And we've got We've got this video of just showing how many times you can reuse it and turn it into all these different things. So 75%, you said, is like still being like remade into like knights in shining armor and <laughs> hubcaps and um, all this stuff. So is this, I'm starting to see this in a lot of places already and it just launched like two months ago. Yeah, yeah. So the, the beverage company, which is headquartered here in New York, AMI, that produces Vitacoco, um, asked us to come aboard to help them really better understand what their essentially trash footprint is and to figure out ways to improve upon that. So we work very closely with them. Um, and, and in January of this last year, when I think we casually mentioned on some meeting that we were going to launch a single-use plastic water bottle campaign, they said, should we like try to produce a I don't know, some water in an aluminum can? And we were like, yes, that would be incredible because what we learned from the straw campaign is that without an alternative, it's really difficult for people to engage. And, and I am not one who is going to tell a mom who has four children who is you know, living on the, like a thread, does not have the means to buy a reusable water bottle, or God forbid, and this happens in so many parts of our community, does not have access to clean potable water for her children. I am not going to tell her that the only option you have is to refill a reusable. Reusables are critical, and it's an important part of this. But we also need to provide affordable solutions that people can access no matter where they are. So we look at this as a suite mm -hmm. of solutions. But they took this to market in less than four months, which is almost unheard of. The entire brand is focused on recycling. So for us in our national research, what we found is that with a recycling message, so talking about single-use plastic, plastic water bottles, and a recycling message, then people are more likely to gravitate towards an alternative, which is why you're seeing this on the shelf everywhere. It's in Target, it's, I think it's going to Walmart, Amazon, I mean, it's, it's gonna be everywhere, which is great, My but there's more favorite coming companies. out. And the Momoa has a new, <laughs> your mom's favorite company is perfect. But it has value, right? Has this value. material has value, so yeah. it won't, what we see in terms of what ends up on the ground, if exactly. it has value, it won't end up on the ground. That's right. And here's the last example we have of that, is like, we're turning fishing nets, which are one of the largest sources of ocean pollution, is abandoned, or derelict fishing gear, like how can that be reclaimed and turned into, in this case, like carpet tiles? Um, and so I think, Dune, um, the last question I wanna ask you is around this, right? So I think Lonely Whale's work on shifting um, the sort of like cultural conversation has been fascinating to watch and it's working. Um, but the behind the scenes stuff, I think is more interesting, oh, probably because I just don't know who any of the people in these videos are. Um, but this, tell us about the next wave roundtable and, and how that's actually working to shift, um, shift corporate practices as opposed to culture. And it's actually the perfect marrying of Dune and Jenna here on stage, because the work that you guys do at the New Materials Institute would be good to chat about as well. Um, we, uh, we were fortunate to work with Dell Technologies early on um, as Adrian was working with them as their first social good advocate and he challenged them, could you please solve for the ocean plastic crisis while I'm helping you with your social good goals? And they were like, yeah, but what is this ocean plastic crisis? Um, and, and around the same time, HP was also on their own looking at the same issue. Um, and what the two of these big tech giants were really focused on is how can we, as technology companies, 
address this ocean plastic crisis and scale it up internally. This exact same time, actually a few years before, Interface was working with Dr. Heather Caldaway with the Zoological Society of London to stand up a program known as Networks. Um, and so all three of these entities were working individually to solve for a gigantic problem by stopping the flow of plastic before it gets into the ocean, or in the case of fishing nets, is to is encourage fishers and give them an economic alternative to deposit them properly on land versus in the ocean. Just cutting them loose. And that's the yeah. derelict fishing gear and the ghost fishing gear is probably one of the easiest things for us to solve for and one of the most difficult as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we stood up a program called Next Way Plastics. It launched in December 2017, where right now we have eight, uh, nine companies. We're going to add a few more this next year are working together collaboratively in an open source transparent fashion to stand up supply chains, essentially. That's what they're building. They're just building plastic supply chains within 50 kilometers of any waterway. They're sourcing as many plastics as they can, and they are innovating internally around how do we leverage this material for our products. So we're permanently m turning them into, in case of human scale, office chairs. In the case of Interface, it's carpet tiles. In the case of HP, they just, I think it's the most groundbreaking thing they just released, which is this laptop called the Dragonfly that has a percent of plastic that came from Haiti now integrated into their speaker. They created a blended polymer, which for us, like we can geek on this all day. For you, doesn't, you don't really blended need to pay polymers, attention to that. Anyone getting excited? But you, can, you can buy an HP, an HP laptop Maybe now just us. that has uh, has PET water bottles that were once bound for the Caribbean Ocean. So this is this it's idea exciting. of like, like no, so to see this. no virgin plastic, like no new plastic. No We've new got plastic. enough on the planet. We saw so the graphs. Let's just keep using that. And it's turning it into value. It's creating value from waste. I think also what about these, I mean, some people say, well, what, what does it matter if I buy a laptop here or um, the shoes here or the carpet here? It's catalyzing infrastructure in these places. I've been to these places. It is increasing working conditions, health conditions. When you see these people, even though they're in these dire straits, their main concern is that they're not going to be able to keep working. And in some cases, it's about they are managing waste. How can we improve their conditions, include them? But it, it, it provides them a whole new infrastructure to work in, in, a, in even a more meaningful way when they'll understand what's happening and appreciate that. And when you think that every human scale ocean task chair that you could purchase and sit your little derriere on every single day has two pounds of plastic that once was fishing gear off the coast of Chile bound to you know do harm to some marine animal that feels good I'd that, rather that's have you that in my individual office than, every single day than strangling a seal for sure absolutely and they build community economies mm -hmm. I mean the work that Heather's done in the Philippines is building an entire you know economic system within community savings banks and mm -hmm. you know providing economic livelihood beyond this as a start so there's all these opportunities to get really creative if we're thinking about how all these things intertwine, right? Like the, the culture and the economy and all the different business opportunities and the engineering. Um, and so, but, but my favorite ocean plastic solution is like super low tech. Um, so I just want to introduce you um, to Mr. Trash Wheel by way of closing. So a lot of the the plastic that enters the ocean is running um, out of rivers and streams. And so this innovation is in Baltimore. Um, and the idea is there is like a boom that gathers together all the plastics that's floating down. And then the trash wheel turns and it dumps the plastic into a dumpster and then you haul it away. So lest we think that everything has to be like a very high-tech engineering solution to how do we gather plastic, um, you can ask us over drinks what we feel about this like ocean cleanup nonsense that this Dutch kid is running. Is the microphone, are we still recording? I'm not a fan. It's not working. It's killing a lot of animals. It's very expensive. It's sucking a lot of the air out of the room. But this very effective and there's an opportunity to have something like this at the mouth of many rivers to just stop the 
a lot of it from getting to the scene. And I would say this sort of also marries our work in terms of um, collection, but also this is in a local context. And what I think has been so critical about this, it has its own social, Mr. Mr. Trashwheel, Professor Trashwheel is a woman. Um, At a gender reveal party on Twitter, Professor is a woman. (laughs) And so amazing Twitter following. So, you know, in terms of a campaign for education and awareness, that's what's so important, I think, about this. And now... um, the folks, well, the Ocean Cleanup is trying to scale this technology a little bit differently. And it is, though, it's last chance capture. So you do need to have a waste management infrastructure upstream, yeah. you know, in terms of, of doing this. But absolutely, um, I think besides capturing it before it floats out in Baltimore specifically, the outreach and education has been amazing. I mean, the article about Mr. Trashwheel eating his own beer can because they made a beer, you know, Mr. Trashwheel beer, and then he ate his own beer can, and they wrote a story about that. (laughs) That's education. So um, thank you both for what you've done to help create this opportunity for this cultural inflection point, for everyone's voice and their dollars and their individual decisions and their influence of their networks to really start adding up to something. Um, And... At the same time, like we, none of us want to put all the pressure on the individual, right? This is about massive systems change. So I'll just leave you with a quote from Jamie Margolis, who's one of the youth climate leaders. And at the UN, she was like, paper straws are cool and all, but we're gonna need a revolution. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So please join me in thanking our expert guests, June Ives and Jenna Jambach.